Greetings and salutations everybody. Welcome to the companion video here on my YouTube channel. The companion video is exactly that. It's a companion video to the John Campus Show and Open Mic. See, on both of those shows, we set aside time to take live questions, but quite often we don't have time to get to all the questions. But I want to make sure you guys know that if you send in a question, it will get answered. Even if I can't answer it live, we'll then bring it over here onto the companion video to make sure your question gets addressed. So without wasting any time, let's get to the first question that we need to make up for here. And this one comes to us from Maka Andrew who writes, so I take the tank, fly right up to the general's palace, drop it at his feet, and I'm like, boom, you looking for this? Love you, JC. So for those of you who don't recognize the line, that's of course, Rhodey's line, War Machine, from Age of Ultron, when they're at the party, is trying to tell the joke to different people and it's working for some people. I love that line. I mean, I love that that sequence when he's trying to tell it to some people and it really works, then he tries to tell it to the Avengers and none of them laugh. He's like, what's, it's a great scene, I like that. All right, next one comes to us from John Wiles who writes, uh, you know you die more than anyone I ever met. Talbert talking to Coulson on uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 5, Episode 16. Glad to hear you have a Note 8. I love mine. Hope you are enjoying yours. Yeah, uh, my right now my daily uh, phone that I use is a Samsung Note 8. I love it. I'm absolutely in love with the phone. I don't plan on getting another one for a few years. My last one was a Note 5. Uh, and I kept that for a couple of years. Till the Note 8 came, I will probably hang on to this phone for a few years. I absolutely adore this phone. Great pictures, snappy response, everything just works well. And I love the size of it too, so I'm a big fan of the phone. All right, um, next one also comes to us from John Wiles who writes, Hawkeye not in Infinity War, uh, realizing just before month of May because he's afraid of being tagged. <laughs> That's, yeah. So for those of you who don't know, Jeremy Renner, he's got this great looking movie coming out. That's got a terrific cast, including John Hamm, and it's called Tag, and it's about this group of friends who, like, for, I think they said for 30 years, have had this ongoing game of Tag going on. If you haven't seen the trailer, I highly recommend it. I didn't know much about this film before the trailer came out, and then I saw the trailer, and I'm like, hooked completely hooked. I cannot wait to see this movie. If you have not seen the trailer for Tag, hop on YouTube, look for Tag Trailer, and you'll find it. Just go watch it and enjoy it because I think it looks really, really good. All right, A.V. Towns writes, over under 35% that A Quiet Place will be nominated for at least one Oscar. It, it, it's impossible to say. It's, it's way too early, way too early. Um, there could come out 30 films that are all better than A Quiet Place in every single category. So it's impossible to say at this point, this is a better question to ask as we get closer to like November. So maybe like around November, I ask questions about A Quiet Place and Oscar possibilities. Like what I've been telling people is, look, if Quiet Place got nominated, uh, sorry, not, not uh, Quiet Place, but if the Oscars were being held next month, well, then we can talk seriously about Quiet Place getting Oscar nominations. But the fact of the matter is it's, like almost a year away. So let's give it, let's wait till like around November before we start talking about uh, Quiet Plate Oscar chances. Uh, Ali Hussein writes, I enjoy Krypton. Why haven't show introduce Booster Gold instead of Adam Strange? That may have been a great way to introduce him. We never get, uh, we never get the movie. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, Ali. The way my thinking is, and your way of thinking is no less valid than mine. I'm just expressing my thoughts here. The way my my thinking goes is, thank God they didn't use Booster Gold. I Look, both Marvel and DC have their share of ridiculous characters that I hope we never see on the big screen. Booster Gold is one of them. I think he's a stupid character. And I know some of you right now are going... <gasps> Yeah, sorry, I'll say it. I think Booster Gold's a stupid character. I really do. I do not, I have no interest in seeing him on the big screen. I remember being like a little bit flabbergasted. Remember a couple of years ago, there was some talk of DC doing a buddy cop style movie with Booster Gold and Blue Beetle. I remember just thinking, that, that's really stupid. I mean, maybe if, if it's a self-contained movie and they shield the rest of the DCU from the ridiculousness that that would be, maybe it could work, but... Honestly, Booster Gold and that would just be, uh, I think, lame. I think really, really lame. So I'm very glad that Booster Gold's not there. Again, no disrespect to you if you love Booster Gold or anybody else who does. I'm You just ask me, so I'm just giving you my opinion. That's all. All right. Let's move on here. The next one comes to us from Andy Brake, who writes, 
Do you still feel Deadpool 2 will best Solo's box office? I say no chance due to Deadpool 2's R rating versus Solo's PG-13 rating. Give it a larger share of the audience. Okay, yeah, but uh, you know what else had an R rating? It. I believe it had an R rating. Yes, it had an R rating. You know what had a PG rating? PG-13 rating? Justice League. Guess which one made more money? <laughs> it did. It had nothing to do with... Um, it had nothing to do with what its rating was or anything like that. Just people wanted to go see it. People wanted to go see it. So it was rated R, and it made more money than Justice League, and that was PG-13. So, and look, let me get the exact numbers here. The first Deadpool movie, this little superhero nobody had ever really heard of, outside of comic book people, and we are the minority. The first Deadpool movie made almost $800 million. $783 million. So, so it came within a throw of $800 million bucks, And that was the first one. When nobody would ever heard of Deadpool. Right? And they went and audiences loved it. So I think, I'm not guaranteeing it will make more, but I think there's a good chance that Deadpool 2 could make more. I think there's going to be a higher anticipation for it. People love the first one, yada, yada, yada. I think it's conceivable it could make more. It, it might make a little bit less, sure, but it's conceivable it could make more. It's conceivable we could be talking like $900 million. And I don't think, I just don't think the solo movie gets to a billion dollars. And if it's not going to get to a billion dollars or even close, I, I see solo making in the $750 to $800 million range. And if that's the case, then Deadpool 2 should beat it. Should. But we'll have to wait and see. Look, again, it'll all depend on how good um, Solo is. And it'll all depend on how good Deadpool 2 is, how good or bad either of those two films are, because that will obviously influence it a lot. But yeah, man, I, I still believe that Deadpool 2, if I had to put five bucks on it, not 500, but if I had to put five bucks on it, I would put five bucks on Deadpool 2. Uh, and like, ratings be damned. Or Deadpool was rated R, made almost $800 million. So... Yeah, I, I still think that. I do still think that. Hopefully I'm wrong, but I do think that. Uh, John Durig writes, How about them pens? No kidding, right? What was the score of that game? Like 7 nothing. Anyway, Crosby with a hat trick to boot. I don't think Philly was ready at all. It's not about Philly being ready. It's just about how good the pens are. And how good was Malkin in that game? Dear God. I mean... I didn't think we were ever going to see an era again where we would have a three-peat champion, and this could be the year. This could be the year that we get our first three-peat Stanley Cup champion in a long time. So, yeah, it was uh, it was really something to see. Go Sid the Kid. Uh, all right. Andy Brake writes, uh, A friendly wager. Solo wins. You have to wear a Habs swag live on the John Campus show. If Deadpool 2 wins, I'll ship you Leaf swag. Nah, no deal. No deal. I I'll never wear Habs swag. Um, A.V. Towns writes, Hey, John, pa proud Patreon supporter. Thank you so much, uh, A.V. Uh, which is the better prequel trilogy, The Hobbit or Star Wars? I know you strongly dislike the prequels, but I'd rather watch the prequels instead of The Hobbit. I, I like The Hobbit films. Are they a major step down from the Lord of the Rings trilogy? Yes. Yes, they are. They are a major, major step down. But I still thought they were good films. I still enjoyed them. I had my issues with a couple of them, but even with my issues that I had with them, I still thought they were pretty enjoyable films. And uh, yeah, but now again, you gotta understand, I grew up reading The Hobbit. Like that was for a long time, that was my all time favorite book. So I have a little bit of an attachment there and seeing it come to life, I, I just thought was amazing. So um, yeah, I like The Hobbit films. So to me, definitely the better prequel trilogy is The Hobbit by a mile, by a mile. All right, Moose Tack Reviews writes, uh, shit just read up on Brett Ratner and Warner Brothers cutting all ties with his company. It's a shame. I loved Brett. Well, I, I mean, I was never a big fan of Brett Ratner, to be honest with you. Like, I mean, there was uh, Rush Hour 2. I think Rush Hour 2 is my favorite film that Brett Ratner did. Can't really... Oh, you know what? Tower, what was it called? Tower Heist? Um, I think he directed Tower Heist, right? In 2011 with Eddie Murphy and Ben, ben Stiller, 
And was it directed by, I know he was a producer. Yes, it was directed by Brett Reiner. You know what? I didn't mind Tower Heist. I'll give him that one too. But honestly, for the most part, not really a, a Brett Ratner fan. And if even half of the allegations against him are true, then, you know, uh, it's, it's hard for me to feel any kind of, to feel bad for him at all. It's, it's, it's really hard for me to feel bad for him at all, if, if even half the allegations are true. But whatever, Warner Brothers decided that they wanted to cut ties, and they cut ties. Which, on one hand, is kind of unfortunate, because Rat Pack did produce some good stuff. Rat Pack Entertainment overall did produce some good stuff, but, I mean, there it is. Uh, let's see, Damien Munoz writes, Hey, John, big fan. Thank you so much, Damien. First time catching it live. Well, unfortunately, I didn't have time to get to your question live, but hey, it's here anyway. Uh, first time catching it live and super happy about that. Do you buy physical movies when they come out? If so, Blu-ray, DVD, or 4K? No, I don't buy physical media. I ditched physical media years ago. Uh, I, I really do all my films digitally now. I, I just find there's too many advantages to them. Um, there's no disadvantage to digital. And uh, yeah, now I do still get the odd Blu-ray. Like I do still get the odd Blu-ray. Um, but no, and no, I certainly wouldn't do 4K because I don't plan on switching over like any of my stuff to 4K for at least another year or two. For at least another year, year or two. Because I believe there's a possibility 4K could be become obsolete faster than other technologies become obsolete. So I'm not, I don't want to invest a lot of money in upgrading 4K. Plus right now my home theater system looks awesome uh, without 4K. So I'm totally happy with it the way it is. Uh, see, Joe uh, Byram writes, with a complete and utter financial failure of The Last Jedi, over under 45% that Wolverine will appear in Star Wars Episode Nine. Just mess with you, John. After Solo, will Disney have gotten their four billion back and everything is profit now? Um, misspelled profit. Anyway. Did they make four billion in profit? I don't know if they've made four billion in profit, but here's the thing: when they bought Star Wars, um, because yeah, I mean, like the uh, Star Wars: The Force Awakens made two billion dollars at the box office. That made that wasn't two billion in profit. They spent a lot on the movie. They spent a lot on marketing. They spent a lot on different things. But still, when they bought Star Wars uh, for four billion, plus some back end points. It wasn't about turning a profit in like five years. It was about the 20 year plan because you know, you're wondering, have they made money? Well, do you know how much money they're spending right now on that star Wars land? Because now that they own the property, do you know how much money they're spending on building star Wars land in California? Like I, I can't even wrap my head around how much money it is. Um, but they are looking at this investment, not in terms of five years, but in terms of how much money can we make on this overall, this property, not just in the movie things, but over 20 years, over 50 years. They looking at, at Star Wars as being an ever flowing fountain of money uh, to them. So have they already recouped the $4 billion? I'm not totally sure about that. Uh, they got to be getting close one way or the other, but... When it's all, they're going to be set back, of course, with the investments in the new park and all that kind of crap. But long term, they're going to be making so much money, hand over fist, on this long term that it's uh, it's kind of inconceivable to even think about. Uh, Muse Tack Reviews writes: Did you see Starfire images, John? It's awful. No, I didn't. I saw the Beast Boy one, um, and it, they look kind of crappy to me, to be honest. They honestly look like somebody went to a really cheap Halloween costume store and just kind of put a costume together. But then again. Those pictures that we saw are out of context. So let's not get worked up positively or negatively about them. It's not like that Robin picture that came out, which was not a t picture. T that was a framed, purposefully shot that way marketing picture. And it looked great. Those other behind the scenes leaked pictures, those are out of context. We have no idea what the context is for those. So I'm not going to get worked up one way or the other about them at this point. So let's just wait and see. Uh, Brian Esparza writes... Will you see You uh, You Were Never Really Here? I've seen it. Uh, it's my favorite movie this year so far. Not for me. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix showed up at my screening at the Hollywood Arclight. That is one of the really cool things about the Hollywood Arclight Theater is that quite often they will do special Q&As. The guests, like celebrity guests will just show up and stuff like that. It's it's a real ki a kick to go to. 
I very much liked You Were Never Really Here. Um, and what's really cool is that the director of the film, uh, why am I freezing on her? first name's Lynn. Why am I freezing on her last name? Anyway, the director of You Were Never Really Here is also the director from We Need to Talk About Kevin, which was another fabulous film. So it's a really good film. It's not in my top four or five films of the year so far for me personally, but it is a very good film. I enjoyed it. Uh, let's see. Unbeatable writes. Uh, all this talk about where Hawkeye is during Infinity War. It's obvious. His secret mission is to play tag with his... He's like, what is it? Everybody wants to make a joke about tag. It's obvious his secret mission is to play tag with his group of friends for the entire month of May, which is, of course, the premise of the movie Tag. So there you go. You guys are thinking on the same wavelength there. All right. Uh, Javier Barbera, 90, writes... Or Barrera writes... Uh, if one die, which death do you think will cause more emotional and shock in the MCU? Iron Man, since in some way he's the grandfather of the MCU, or Captain America, who in some way is the heart of the MCU. I, I'm going to say Captain America. Um, he is, like you said, he's the heart. Captain America is the heart of the MCU. Um, so I believe his death would cause the most shock, cause the most ripple, have the biggest ripple effect, and have the most emotional impact out of anybody that could kill in the MCU. Uh, I certainly hope they don't. He's certainly not going to die. Well, at least I don't think he's going to die in, in Avengers 3, but um, but we'll have to wait and see. But out of the two of them, and both of them would have huge impacts, but I do believe the biggest one would be Captain America. That's just my opinion, though. Uh, R.O. Olsen writes, All-time favorite feel-good comedy show, John. Mine is Chuck and Scrubs. So fun and good ner nerdy shows. Um, Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec in the Office. Two best feel-good, fun, funny, entertaining comedies um, that you that both of them for me would be in my just overall, not just feel-good comedy, but my overall best comedies ever. I mean, in that conversation, you have to include Seinfeld. Has to be in that conversation as well. Maybe one or two other shows uh, too. But yeah, I would go The Office and, and Parks and Rec for me. Uh, Jeremy Miller writes... Loved Wally. Will we ever get a Wally 2? I don't think so. I, they've never even breathed an idea about a Wally 2. Not to mention Wally really does end. Like the movie Wally ends. And even when you watch the post credit stuff, whereas the not post credit, but the credit stuff, it's like this is the completion of the story. It's done. So um, I loved Wally as well. I love that movie. But there re there's nothing else for them to do and nowhere else for them to go. So. Uh, I don't think they'll ever do a Wally 2. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Uh, Mr. Everything writes, Some of my favorite films in the last few years have been Edge of Tomorrow, Edge of Winter, and The Edge of Seventeen. Which is your favorite? Mine is EOS or Edge of Seventeen, Edge of Tomorrow. I loved Edge of Seventeen. I did. I raved about that movie. But Edge of Tomorrow is just such a great sci-fi surprise of a film because Edge of Seventeen, I suspected, was going to be great. Edge of Tomorrow looked like dog shit. I mean, Edge of Tomorrow just looked horrible. Just horrible. And it turned out to be amazing. So it had the pleasant surprise factor, had the great sci-fi angle. It had great narrative. I thought Tom Cruise was fantastic. Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt were both fantastic in the film. So yeah, I'm going to go. Uh, it's a good question, but I'm going to go with Edge of Tomorrow on that one for me. Uh, Maya Demi writes, can't wait to see Infinity War in less than two weeks. Um, it can't be here soon enough, currently because of all those annoying TV spots popping up everywhere, trying to avoid them. But I want to watch YouTube as well. It's torture. Yeah, they're... Uh, I feel like they're starting to put out too much. Like I was mentioning, I won't say what it was, just in case you haven't seen it, but something happened in one of the TV spots recently, and I went, oh... This is the first time I felt like I wish you didn't show that in the trailer. Like, everything else has been good. Everything else has been perfectly fine to me. But one of the more recent TV spots made me go, oh, and no, it had nothing to do with the Infinity Stones. It made me go, oh, I kind of wish you didn't show that in the trailer. Yeah. So I am I'm over it now. Now when I see things pop up in my Twitter feed or things pop up in my new feed about new Avengers TV spot, I'm not watching it. Uh, I'm just like, if they put out a major theatrical trailer, it is my responsibility then to watch that and talk about it. But for all these TV spots they're cranking out, I don't want to watch anymore. I'm because I'm sold. I'm on board. 
Uh, and maybe other people still need more TV spots to get sold, and that's fine. But for me, I'm already sold. I don't want to watch any more of them. Um, Jamil Taylor writes, favorite Sons of Anarchy character. I felt like somebody just asked me that last week. Uh, long live Opie. I mean, Opie's certainly there. And it, look, exactly what I said before. Opie, Tig. I mean, obviously Jax, because he's the main character, but I love the Clay character. I love the Gemma character. I mean, I, I like them all. Bobby was a great character, but yeah, I'll probably go Ope. I'll probably go Ope on that one. Uh, Kim Young Hoon writes, saw Rampage, was 100% sure that the writers had no idea the, of the history of CRISPR and how it works. Fun movie, but they should have used a made-up term. Oh, I disagree, Kim. Disagree completely. As a matter of fact, it's funny because I actually read an article on this one science website talking about how all the different things they actually got right about CRISPR. For those of you who know what CRISPR is, and I am by no means a geneticist, <laughs> but the basic idea of CRISPR is that it's, it's about DNA editing, right? Particularly about trying to like uh, cure diseases and people before they even get them, you know, particularly they work better with, with like young, the younger you are, the easier it'll work anyway. It's about going in, cutting out bad DNA, letting healthy DNA grow back in its place. Blah, blah, blah. I, again, I am no geneticist, so please forgive me. But I remember reading this article after I saw Rampage about how a number of, like this one science uh, site was talking about, it's actually really kind of fun how, I mean, clearly there are a number of things that they made up for dramatic stuff, but they there are a number of things they got right about it. And here's the thing, they shouldn't have made up something else instead, a different term, because some of the best things to use in fiction is when they have threads of truth in reality. That's kind of when you get to have some fun. That's when you give it a little bit of a hint of a believability. Not believability, but just the, the, the smell of believability. Just a little bit in there. And when you can add that in, it adds to the overall drama. So um, I completely disagree. I think these guys, when they wrote this, they researched what CRISPR is, and they wrote their kind of thing around that, obviously taking tons of liberties for sure. Um, and I also don't think they should have changed the term of it because just having little threads of things that are in real life kind of adds to the movie as a whole. I don't think anybody's coming out of there thinking, wow, this technology CRISPR is about making monsters. I don't think anybody's dumb enough to come out of a movie thinking that. It's just for fun, dramatic effect, and I think it worked kind of well, but that's just me. All right, Hard Boiled Entertainment writes, but John, literally the entire MCU has been building up to Infinity War. If the payoff sucks, it's bigger than just one movie out of many. Oh, no, you're wrong, sir. Okay, so here's the thing. This comes out of a question that we had on the John Campius show earlier, where um, somebody asked me, you know, hey, what if Infinity War sucks? What's the consequences? What's the repercussions? What's going to What's going to be the fallout if people go see Infinity War and it's terrible? My point of view on this was simply that, hey, look, this this would be it would be one bump in the road. Like, let's talk. The conversation becomes different if they have two or three disappointing films in a row. But the fact of the matter is, they have put out film after film after film after film after film that is both audience and critically loved. I mean, that that's beyond dispute. That, that's that's non-debatable. They have put out film after film. The audience and the critics love Thor Ragnarok. The audience and the critics love Spider-Man Homecoming. The audience and the critics love Doctor Strange. The audience and the critics love Spider-Man, or uh, Spider-Man, uh, Captain America Civil War. And it goes back more. If they now come across one that they have a big hiccup, it is just one film. Now, that's cool. We, you, we can make things up and say, oh, but this one means more. And ultimately, no, it doesn't. Ultimately, it's still one movie that you're paying the price of one movie ticket to go and watch, and you're going to have a good or a bad experience with it. It's still to me that if it's a bad experience, it'll be quickly brushed off by the next one that comes out, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Now, I also said the conversation is different if this movie's bad and then the next one's bad too, then we start having a different conversation. But at this point, if you rip off six, seven, eight in a row that the audience and critics love, and then you put out one, that does not derail the MCU. It doesn't derail the MCU. But this one means more. No, I'll, I'll, we can say that. We, we can speak the words and pretend it makes it real, but, but it's not. It's still just one movie. No one is going to ditch or abandon the MCU 
if this one's bad and if this one's terrible. Because there's just been far too many that have been great. That far too many that audiences love and critics love and have box office success and all that kind of nonsense. Just far too many. Would, is it a little bit more significant than like say if Ant-Man and the Wasp was terrible? Sure, sure. But it's still one movie. Now again, the conversation becomes a different conversation if like you get two in a row or heaven forbid, three in a row, then the tone of the conversation completely changes, but it's still just one movie. It is still just one movie. No matter how much Marvel hypes it up, no matter how much the audience hypes it up, at the end of the day, it's one movie. And uh, if this one disappoints, that'll suck. And believe me, folks, nobody wants to believe me when I tell them this, but you better bet your ass that there is a possibility that this movie could suck because there's a possibility that every movie coming out could suck. Avengers Infinity War is no different. I believe it's going to be awesome for sure, but you better have a little party you prepared that, hey, you know, it's still a movie. It's still a motion picture. Making a good movie is one of the hardest things in the world to do. Therefore, this one could disappoint. It could. But even if it does, it, it doesn't change anything. Not after one movie. Uh, Blackheart Cinema writes, have you ever seen the Joker blogs or the Asylum Batman fan series? Have you seen any Batman fan films that you like? No, not really. Um, no, I'm not saying that they're, they're all terrible. I'm saying I'm, I have no interest in watching them, to be honest with you. I don't even watch a lot of Star Wars fan films. Uh, I mean, I used, there, was, there was a period of time when I, could, I would just eat up every Star Wars fan film that got made. But I, um, for whatever reason, I just kind of stopped watching them. I mean, I've made fan films, so it's not, I'm not poo-pooing on the idea of fan films. Not at all, but I just found myself that I don't find myself going around clicking on them or, or looking for fan films. That's just me, though. Uh, I think fan films are a great thing to get involved in if you're looking to get into making stuff. That's fantastic. And believe me, I've consumed a lot of fan films over the years, but I just found the last number of years, I just, uh, I just don't watch them anymore. And this is coming from somebody who's made fan films, so there you go. Uh, let's see. Hardboard Entertainment writes, there is another possibility that Walter Hamada has repaired bridges with uh, with Batflick and he's back on as Batman. Well, look, I've mentioned that myself, Hardboiled. Look, it's with new leadership in there, with them sweeping out old leadership, maybe some of the old leadership they've swept out is some of the leadership that maybe Ben Affleck had problems with. Who knows? Maybe now we've got Walter Hamada in there and maybe Walter Hamada's first order of business is to mend those fences with Ben Affleck and to get the bat flick thing back on and going. Wouldn't that be amazing? I doubt that for a couple of reasons. One, it's not like a Robert Downey Jr. scenario. And believe me, there is nothing more I want for the MCU than a Ben Affleck as Batman. But this isn't like a Robert Downey Jr. with the MCU, where everything you put Robert Downey Jr. in with the MCU as Iron Man is a smash, smash hit. Even Iron Man 3 made over a billion dollars. We're talking about the guy who's playing Batman with a Batman versus Superman movie that while I liked it, it was incredibly divisive amongst the audiences. The, the critics hated it. Then you've got Justice League, which nobody even bothered to go and watch anymore. Like, again, we're talking about a movie that should have challenged for $2 billion and it ended up getting just over $600 million. Like, I think $650 million dollars. Which, good grief, Deadpool made more money than Justice League. Wrap your heads around that for a second. Deadpool made more money. Deadpool, an R-rated thing about this, this cartoon character, that, that this comic book character that a lot of people had never even heard of, and it made more money at the box office than Justice League did. Um, you know, Doctor Strange... Doctor Strange made more money at the box office than Justice League did. Wrap your heads around that one, too. Doctor Strange made more money than a movie with Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, all in the same movie. Beat it. It's, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Um, that, it's, it's not the same as Robert Downey Jr. being Iron Man, and they have to have him in there. Unfortunately, that's not really the scenario here. We've had Ben Affleck as Batman, and they've had bad results. I mean, I like the films, but I mean, overall, uh, divided fan base, 
Critics just hated it and financially questionable. And so I don't know that Warner Brothers, I don't know that Walter Hamada's, no matter what I would wish him to do, I don't know that Walter Hamada's number one priority is to get Ben Affleck back on board with Batman. I don't know that it's Walter Hamada's, you know, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know if, it, if it's Walter Hamada's agenda at all to save anything about the DCEU. For all we know, Walter Hamada looks at the DCEU and the way it was handled with that stage one and go, that was a complete failure. We need to reevaluate how we do everything. And maybe Shazam and this, this standalone Joker movie, if it ever happens, maybe all this kind of stuff are going to be the first steps towards that. Or maybe not. I don't know. I will say this, though, Harboyle. I think what you're suggesting is something I myself have suggested too, that, hey, that's one of the possibilities. It is definitely one of the possibilities. I don't think it's going to be the case, but it is one of the possibilities for sure. All right, let's move on here. Uh, Manual Conception, I love that name, writes, John, if it was, uh, if you was to recommend five MCU movies to watch before Infinity War, what would it be? I say Captain America Civil War, Avengers 1, Thor 2, Black Panther, Doctor Strange, uh, my friend has Avengers 1, Captain America, Guardians 1, Black Panther, Doctor Strange. Well, I put up a video the other day that said, if you, ha if you only had time to watch three, here's the three you need to watch. And I believe that's Avengers 1, I believe it's Civil War, and I believe it's Black Panther. Uh, because clearly Wakanda is such a big player in, uh, in Avengers Infinity War, I thought that was important. You got to see the first Avengers to even get an understanding about the universe. And you got to see Civil War to understand the status of the Avengers going into that movie. However, in that video, I also said you can make a very strong case for Guardians 1 because Guardians 1 is the one MCU movie that, number one, gives you a better explanation about Infinity Stones than any of the other MCU films, and number two, you get a better look at Thanos than in any of the other films as well. So you can make it, so I obviously, if I was going to increase that to five films, I got to add Guardians 1 to that, and then I would probably add Doctor Strange. Um, you could also make an argument for Thor Ragnarok. Uh, understanding how that film ends, the, where we find uh, Thor, Thor having his mended relationship with his brother Loki. That's another one you'd have to consider as well. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so those are, those are six. The five I would, the four I would say for certain, Capt uh, First Avengers, um, Captain America Civil War, Black Panther, and Guardians of the Galaxy, and then as a fifth one, your wild card one, it's a pick 'em between Doctor Strange or Thor Ragnarok. So that's kind of how I feel about that. Uh, Jordan Griffin writes, Korean film The Wailing, now on Netflix, is one of my favorite movies ever. Every thought, very thought provoking. Have you seen it? Thoughts? I haven't seen it. I'll be honest with you, I haven't even heard of it. Um, but if you like it that much, I will throw it on my queue there on Netflix and, um, and at least check it out. At least go, at least tonight, go and check out a trailer for it. I'll go and check out the trailer for it. Thanks for putting on people's radar, Jordan. All right. All right. Uh, Tennis Vlado writes, trying to save up for a trip to Canada, uh, have always wanted to visit thinking about going to Toronto, meeting up with a friend of mine who lives in Kitchener, any sightseeing ideas? Well, just about anything in Toronto. You, you want to go to the Rogers center. Uh, you'll want to go to the uh, to um, the CN Tower. You'll want to go to the lakefront. You'll want to go onto Young Street. I mean, there's a lot of things in Toronto to do. Um, Kitchener is is pretty outside of Toronto, but that's fine. I, I used to spend some time in Kitchener uh, myself, the Kitchener Waterloo area. But uh, yeah, just make sure you go up the CN Tower. Just make sure you go up the CN Tower. It's a terribly tourist thing to do, but it's a tourist thing for a reason. You'll want to go up the CN Tower, as long as you're not scared of heights like me. Um, Kane Erturan, who writes, John, awesome videos. You truly inspire me. Thank you so much, Kane. Uh, do you think they will make a Thor 4 with Taika Waititi? Ragnarok was amazing, and I want more Thor, Thor desperately. I think there's a chance. I really do. I mean, uh, Chris Hemsworth loved doing Thor Ragnarok. He loved working with Taika Waititi. And clearly, Marvel loved the results they got. Because that was a movie that made over $800 million. By the way, Thor made more money than Justice League. Um, Ragnar Let me get the exact total here for you. Thor Ragnarok made $853 million. So clearly, they were very, Marvel's very happy with the result. Chris Hemsworth was super happy with the result. Taika Waititi had a blast. 
I wouldn't be, I wouldn't doubt it at all if we got a, a Thor 4 announced. I would not doubt it at all. I, if I had to give an over and under number to it, I'd say 40%, which still, yes, makes it unlikely, but it's a much stronger possibility than you'd think. So I think a 40% chance is a, is a very valid number for that. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, Tennis Flato writes, I better not do like Jerome Lim and watch Black Dynamite. My wife would not like me going out with the hot girl at gym. Yeah, so earlier today, Jerome Lim mentioned, because one of the movies I'm constantly recommending is Black Dynamite with Michael Jai White. Awesome movie. Anyway, uh, so uh, Jerome Lim sent in this uh, comment says, I finally watched Black Dynamite. The hot girl at the gym asked me out. I got a raise at work and something else good happened to him. I mean, it was a really funny comment. I really enjoyed it. So Tim Splato is clearly replying to that one. It's good. Uh, ben Rayner writes, uh, mean over under 30% Clooney cameo in Ocean's 8. Okay, okay. So earlier today, Ben Rayner sent in a, a super chat where it said over under 30% Colony um, in Ocean 8. I'm like, Colony in Ocean 8? What are you talking about? Clooney cameo. Um, I'll take the over. 30% seems like a really low number for that. So I will definitely take the over on 30% for sure. Uh, ben Lorenowitz writes, Raiders of the Lost Ark is my favorite movie of all time. That's not a bad one to have as a favorite. I tell people Star Wars, the original, Lord of the Rings, and Back to the Future are also my top 10. Is this a cop-out or a cheat to include trilogies? I don't consider it a top, like, cop-out like because I do it myself. When people talk to me about my top 10 favorite films of all time, I list Star Wars, the original trilogy, as one entry. And I also list Lord of the Rings as one entry. So I don't think it's a cheat. Some other people might consider that a cop-out. Some other people might consider that a cheat. But when I think of the, the original Star Wars trilogy, I don't really think in terms of Star Wars, Empire, Return of the Jedi. I just think of the Star Wars movies, the trilogy, the trilogy. When I think of Lord of the Rings, I don't really think in terms of Fellowship, Two Towers, Return of the King. I think of the Lord of the Rings. You know what I mean? So I, I do the same thing as you, Ben. I kind of count it all as one thing. Maybe I shouldn't. Who knows? Uh, Dr. Panders writes, do you think video games should be adapted into TV shows? Would it be easier or would it not make, it would make no difference at all? No difference at all. You can either tell a good story or you can't. Um, and I don't think there's any reason to believe that you know, if some people took a property, made a movie out of it, made a bad movie, there's no reason to believe they would do any better making it a TV show. So I, I really, I really don't see it as any difference whatsoever. Uh, Kev Campbell writes, David Leach is directing the Fast and Furious spinoff movie Hobbs and Shaw. Thoughts? I'm going to talk about it on the upcoming John Campia show a little bit more in depth. So, so I'm going to push off your question. I'll just say this. Love it. Love it. I'll go more depth than on the John Campus show. Make sure you come back a little bit later and watch the John Campus show as we talk about that. Uh, Stark Syndrome writes, how can I watch Annihilation? Not on Netflix in the U.S. It's in, it's, it's the last I checked, it's still in over 150 theaters in the U.S. So you can, depending on where you live, but with it being in 150 theaters, that means it's probably, if you search, if you get online, go to Fandango, do a search for Annihilation, find out where the closest theater is to you, and you should still be able to go and see it. See, here's the problem. It's not on Netflix in the U.S. because there are contracts that the, the studios have um, with theaters. And basically, it's this. There are exceptions, yes, but I'm just talking in general. The thing is this. If you put out a movie in a theater, you can't release that movie on home video for at least three months. Uh, that's generally, uh, there's some finagling, there's some exceptions here, and there, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but generally speaking, there is this understanding with the movie theater chains that if you want to play your movie in theaters, that's fine, then you can't put it out on home video for at least three months, or else the theaters aren't going to carry your movie. The theaters won't play your, your movie in their theaters if you're just going to go out and put it up on Netflix or put it out on Blu-ray or put it out on um, uh, VOD or something like that like three weeks later. Because then the movie theater is like, well, why should we bother taking up our screen time if you're just going to put it out on home video in like two weeks? You know what I mean? So in the Annihilation, there are international markets where Annihilation did not do a theatrical distribution and it went right to Netflix in some countries. Whereas in North America, it did get a theatrical uh, release. Therefore, it's not allowed to be on Netflix for at least three months. 
at least three months from when it premieres. So um, if you really want to see Annihilation, you can. It's still in theaters. You can find a theater and go see it there. If you don't want to do that, then you're going to probably have to wait, what, another two months? How long ago did Annihilation come out? Like a month ago? So you probably got have about another eight weeks to wait, and then you'll be able to see it. Um, let's see. Warrington Train Spotter 2778 writes, Ready Player One is a great movie. I enjoyed all wood reference. I'm not quite sure what all wood reference is, but I think what you're saying is you got all the references. And here's the thing. You don't know if you got all the references. Oh, you're saying you enjoyed all the references. I did too. I mean, that's just one of the many things that I thought was so great about Ready Player One. The best part about Ready Player One was the story, the sense of adventure, all that kind of stuff. But the references were a really nice uh, addition to that as well. All right. The number Thor writes, with Ben Affleck no longer being Batman, if they are still looking for an older, more mature Batman, I always thought Josh Brolin would be a great older Batman. Thoughts? Nah, it wouldn't be my first choice. Don't get me wrong. If they announced, uh, if they announced him as Batman tomorrow, I go, oh, okay, not my first choice, but all right, I'd be, I'll, I'll get on board with it. Yeah, it'd be fine. Um, I think there are other guys who would be better at it, to be honest with you. But Brolin's a good actor, so I just, I don't see him as Batman at all. Like not even in a little bit. But he's a good actor, and that's the most important thing. So, like I said, if they announced that they, he was going to be Batman tomorrow, I'd go, eh, really? Brolin? I like Brolin, but as Batman? Well, okay, and I'd get on board with it. It would be fine, but no, certainly not my first choice. Uh, Yo Mama's Llama writes, What is the difference between sleeping through a roll and subtle performance? Oh, massive difference. What do you look for to differentiate? No, no, like, sleepwalking is basically you can just tell they're not even trying. And sometimes not even trying is expressed through lack of subtlety. Like sleeping through a roll is not just always being quiet. It's not like literally sleepwalking and always being like this. That's not what it is. But like, for instance, a great example of this, Bruce Willis in the latest Death Wish movie. He does not give a shit in that movie. You can just tell. Like, and it's not, it's not, it's, there's nothing to confuse with what he does in that movie with subtlety. <laughs> nothing he does in that movie uh, can be called subtle. It's all like, okay, now you're angry. Oh, you know, it's just, you can tell, he just doesn't care. He just didn't care. And there are times, and look, if Bruce Willis just wasn't a very good actor, then, then it wouldn't look like he's not caring. But we know Bruce Willis is a good actor. And so when he goes into a movie like Death Wish, you can just tell, oh, he, you, he clearly did not care about this movie at all. And you can just see it in the performance. It's massively, see, you're, you're confusing what, what I believe you're confusing. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm misunderstanding you. What I believe you're confusing is, is subtle, like, like reservedness, right? That, that's not, like you take a movie like Death Wish again, Bruce Willis many times was like, blah, 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 when that's not what a good performance, that's not what he would have done if he cared about this movie. There would have been more subtlety in it. So there's no confusing subtlety with somebody who just doesn't care. Like when I, so when I say somebody who just slept through a movie, what I'm really saying is that you can clearly tell they didn't care. They didn't bother to put in any effort. And you can really, and sometimes not putting in any effort isn't about being quiet. Sometimes it's about being over the top because that's just the simplest thing to do. Who cares? Oh, uh, this guy's wife just died. Okay. Why? It's just easier to do that than to try to show subtle pain and torment and regret and anger and loss and what all that can be wrapped up in something that would be far more difficult of a performance to do. Ah, it's just easier to go, Wah! you know what I mean? And you can, you can just tell that. So yeah, worlds of difference between subtle and not caring. Like massive, massive difference. Um, Cameron Wiskovich writes, John, what if a game studio made an action game where you're the main character and the final boss is Martian Manhunter in the Iron Spider suit? It's simple. I just don't play the game. It's just that simple. I have no desire of playing the game with either Martian Manhunter or Spider-Man being reduced to being Iron Man Jr. Just not just in that game, you son of a bitch. Um, H. Mong for you writes, 
Did you know that Into the Badlands is based off Chinese folklore, Journey to the West, AKA Monkey King with a modern twist? No, I did. Well, I mean, let's put it this way. I could tell it definitely comes from some major Chinese influences. I mean, all you gotta do is look at who the producers of the film are or of the show are. I just started watching Into the Badlands this week. I am loving this show. Just loving this show. Um, I, I just couldn't eat it up any more than I am. I mean, the political intrigue with the barons, the martial arts aspects of it, the whole like spirit of the samurai kind of feel to it with the clippers and all this kind of stuff. Seeing Nick Frost pop up in there was a real pleasant surprise. I am digging this show so hard. Um, but so I could tell there's definitely some influence, but I didn't know the specifics. So talking about things like Journey to the West and things like that, I didn't know that. Uh, so that's something I have to look into more. Uh, Dr. Panders writes, if you and Ann ever wanted to go to Disneyland, let me know. I'm a CM there. I'll email you. I don't know what CM is, um, but uh, custodian maintenance is, is CM. Um, Captain Marvel? Are you Captain Marvel at Disneyland? I don't know what CM means, but but by all means, email me because we love going to Disneyland. Uh, Geo writes, uh, rewatched Whiplash, in my opinion, a perfect film. Uh, I don't know that I call it perfect, but uh, in my opinion, a perfect film and second favorite movie, Intense and J.K. Simmons, Damien Chazelle is something special with two Oscar films in two years. Oh yeah, no shit. And, and he's got another one coming this, uh, out this year, um, called, uh, I believe, I believe it's First Man. Hold on, let me just double check that. I believe it's called First Man. Let me double check. Uh, yeah, that he's doing with Ryan Gosling and Claire Foy. And it's about, you know, the, the first guy to walk on the moon. It's about Neil Armstrong. Uh, listen to this cast, Claire Foy, Ryan Gosling, Jason Clark, John Bernthal, Pablo Schreiber, Kyle Chandler, uh, Corey Stoll. I mean, it is a dynamite, Lucas Haas, it is a dynamite cast, dynamite cast. And we're, we're could be looking at like three years in a row, kind of, or three films in a row for Damien Chazelle. And it's just looking amazing. Yes, Whiplash was spectacular. I, I, again, I don't know that I call it a perfect movie, but I love the movie. J.K., of course, winning his Academy Award for that film. It's, it's monstrous. It's great. Uh, Suburban Nerd writes, I had more issues with A Quiet Place, and I thought Dad in front, kids in middle, and Mom back seemed more responsible. So this goes back to another comment Suburban Nerd put in thought, he didn't like A Quiet Place, which is cool. All film is subjective. No film is going to be liked by everybody. Um, but I, I, I remember I thought it was fun, kind of funny because what Suburban Nerd mentioned is one of his issues with the film. Like, I can't believe the parents were walking in front of the kids. And I'm like, well, no, in that scenario, I think that's what makes the most sense. Like, what do you get? You're going to have a parent walk behind the kid for what? For protect? There's no protecting them. If the creatures hear you, they're going to wipe you out. There's no protecting them. Um, so I always, I, my kind of thought with a quiet place is that you would want the parents walking in front to make sure that everything is quiet and to make sure that the, where they're stepping and if they, if anything's going to be made a noise, you'd rather the parent be the one to make the noise and get wiped out by the monsters as opposed to the kids. So, uh, again, I'm going to disagree with you on that suburban. Again, if you don't like if you didn't like the movie, that's totally fine too, man. That's the subjectivity of film. That's perfectly fine. But I still will disagree with you on that particular issue about the walking order of parents and kids. I can't believe we even consider that to be an important issue at all. But even still, I will debate you on that issue because I believe the way they did in the movie was probably the right way to do it. But that's just my thoughts. Uh, Joshua Stevens writes... What is your favorite episode of Supernatural? Mine is Baby. Inside point of view from the Impala uh, took the cake. That was such a brilliant idea for like from the car's perspective, right? Because the car is a character in that show. I mean, it's weird to think of it that way, but the car really is a character in the show. It's the baby, man. Um, there are too many for me to think about. The one season finale when... Um, uh, uh, Sammy ends up getting locked in the cage when they finally stop the apocalyptic battle between Michael and Lucifer. That was a great episode. I, I mean, really, there's, uh, it's 13 seasons worth that I'd have to go over and think through, but uh, there's just too many for me to think about. That, But the, the definitely the one, that one season finale is definitely one that uh, jumps up in my head. Uh, Joshua Stephen writes, Tombstone, a top three Western of all time for you. Mm, no. I like Tombstone a lot. I do. But it's not top 
three for me. I don't even know that it's in top five. I think for me, when you're talking top three, you're talking like Unforgiven. You're talking Once Upon a Time in the West. Uh, you're talking about Outlaw, Jonesy Wales. Um, you got to think about Good, Bad, and the Ugly. You got to, you got to talk about maybe a little bit about um, uh, the... Uh, uh, what's Why am I forgetting the exact name of it? The... The death of Jesse James, by the, the the killing of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Ford. How does that? It's one of Brad Pitt and uh, Casey Affleck. Uh, is it the death of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford? I can't I can't remember the exact table. But anyway, there's that one. Um, there's uh, you know uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid has got to be up there. Um, I mean, Tombstone's a really good movie, and I enjoy it a lot, but I don't think it's in my top... I, you know, it might not even be in my top 10 favorite westerns, to be honest with you, but I do like it. I like it a lot. I just wouldn't put it that high myself, personally. But you do. That's perfectly great. It uh, doesn't mean I'm right and you're wrong. You're probably right and I'm probably wrong. Uh, Dominic Suma writes, It sounds like you met Blind Al at the market... Oh, you're talking about the story? I so I told that story earlier today. I won't go through the whole story about this woman I met in the market today. This little old lady. It was like... One of my favorite experiences that I will remember for a long time. It was a really simple little exchange. And I was like, what the hell just happened? It was, go back and watch, um, go back and watch yesterday's episode of Open Mic. And because I tell this story in it that, I don't know, maybe to you guys it sounded boring, but to me it was just cracking me up. Um, the number Thor writes, I remember once someone brought up that Iron Man 4 would only happen if Mel Gibson directs it. And I don't know, um if that was a thing, but it might explain why they have not announced Iron Man 4 as it would be an obvious moneymaker. Um, I, I don't know whoever said that they'd only do Iron Man 4 if Mel Gibson directs it. Uh, I've never heard that myself, and I'm sure that has nothing to do with it. I, I, yeah, I, I've, that's one of the reasons I got to believe that Robert Downey Jr. is not done in the MCU. Look, Iron Man 3 made over a billion dollars. Iron Man 3 made over a billion dollars. They throw Iron Man in the Spider-Man film, makes over 800, it became the number one box office comic book movie of the year. Um, so I got to believe that somewhere down there, they want to do another Iron Man. I just, it just kind of feels like they would. I mean, maybe they don't, maybe they don't, but I just know if I'm a studio exec, I'm like, dude, I mean, we're printing money making these Iron Man films. People come out to see them. They want to come out and see them. Robert Downey Jr. is still on top of his game. Uh, let's do it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we'll have to see what happens. But I'm sure it has nothing to do with Mel Gibson in any way, shape, or form. All right, Leader of Bats writes, Are you scared of balding? Uh, nice hairline, by the way. No, I have no fear of balding. It's funny because my dad's my dad's bald. And my uncle, like his brothers, uh, his brother, I should say, is bald. Um, my cousin was balding. But, like, everybody who was balding in my family started balding at, like, 18 18 to 22 uh, is when they all started balding. And, you know, I'm in my 40s. So, I, I mean, my, my, hair's, my hair's not going anywhere. Uh, it, it is what it is. It's there. It's, it's not moving. So, uh, no. I, I mean, I think I remember when I was in high school, I was worried about it because my dad was bald and, like, I had so many of my relatives that were bald. And I, I was a little bit worried about it. I mean, all, I would have gotten over it. Like, who cares? Some of the sexiest men alive go bald. I mean, and, like, look at The Rock and look at, you know, so no big deal. But as a teenager, it's a, it's a source of insecurity. So, sure, as a younger teenager, I was a little bit insecure about that. But uh, especially since I had, like, my hair down to here. Like, I had my long, I'm a rock and roller kind of hair at the time. But, um, but no, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I have no fear at this point of losing my hair. The only way I'm losing my hair at this point is if I shave it off, um, which I've been tempted to do from time to time. Uh, okay. Uh, Puneet Singh writes, can't watch live, uh, binging into the Badlands, more into the Badlands. Anyway, just keep up the great work. Bye for now. Thank you so much, Puneet. And yeah, I'm in the middle of binging it myself. I'm rounding out. I'm getting ready to round out season two here pretty soon. So... Getting ready for season three. All right. The number Thor writes, uh, will we get more Riddick movies? I love those movies. What are your thoughts on them? And Dominic Tretto could beat Superman without kryptonite. Pretty much. Yeah. If if Superman were to show up in a Fast and the Furious movie, uh, producer uh, Vin Diesel, who I love Vin Diesel, but what producer Vin Diesel would do is insist not only does he beat Superman, but he beats him handily. Like handily. No sweat. Because he's 
dominant because he's Dom Toretto, man. Dom Toretto. Um, I'm not a fan of the Riddick movies, to be honest with you. I didn't like Pitch Black. I didn't like, um, and I didn't like the other ones, which is really strange because I do love Vin Diesel and I like a lot of his stuff. But for whatever reason, that particular franchise didn't click with me. I don't know why. Can't really put my finger on it. But, you know, it didn't really work for me. But, oh, well, there's tons of other stuff that, that he does that I really do enjoy. Um, uh, Marv Diesel writes, no spoiler. Did you see the Krasinski interview on Empire Podcast that explained the origins of the creatures in Quiet Place? Yes, I did. He didn't really explain the origins. He just kind of said what he had in his head, you know. They never committed to any of that stuff. And I, just in case you guys don't want to know what it is, I'm not going to say what it is. All I'm going to say is, I didn't interpret what Krasinski was saying as an explanation, but rather just him, what he used as his anchor point in his head for what he then wanted to put on screen. But like where they came from, what he, the analogy he made, the wolves, I won't, I won't complete the analogy, but there's a wolves analogy that he makes. All that kind of stuff. To me, that was not really committal about saying, this is me explaining the origin of those monsters. He's just really saying, this is what that was in my head. This is what I was envisioning and making this happen. But it still leaves him the flexibility. If he if they wanted to do A Quiet Place 2 and totally change what the origin, they could because it was never committed to on the screen. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, but yes, it was a fascinating interview though. And if you liked A Quiet Place, look up John Krasinski Empire Interview. And you should be able to find it. And it's it's really quite insightful. It's really good. Uh, okay. Coolio Woolio writes, Why no solo in December? Wait for episode 9 to be shorter. You know what, Coolio? I I appreciate that you're... I can't... I can't... I, I, I read English. Um, so I, I'm, I'm already... Look, I'm two lines into it. I have no idea what we're talking about. So I need to pass over... Please send in more questions, but please write in English so I don't have to try to interpret uh, a question as I'm going. Uh, Kevin Campbell writes, Why is Warner Brothers having so much trouble getting a Batman trilogy off the ground, let alone a cinematic universe? With Nolan, we had one every three years or so. Yeah, yeah, but but it was it was simpler for Nolan in the sense that there was no cinematic universe. There wasn't having to worry about how will we spin off these 18 films off this film and blah, 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 No, it was just its own standalone franchise. It was its own standalone trilogy. And it didn't have to worry about how is this going to affect this? And well, if we do this, how are we going to launch our Batgirl movie? And if we do that, how are we going to do this? No, it was just the beautiful thing of a standalone superhero franchise. That's why, like, one of the things I lament about the, the, the proliferation of cinematic universes is the fact that we've lost the magic of the truly standalone superhero film. Superheroes aren't special anymore. There's a billion superheroes out there, in, even in the movie universe. And there was something really special when Batman was the hero. In the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films, there weren't 85 other superheroes, metahumans running around. Spider-Man was unique in the Raimi films. He was unique. You know, in the Christopher Reeve Superman films, he was alone. I mean, he was unique. And there is something that we are missing today. Everyone, everybody wants 5,000 heroes in every movie. And not only is it, is it not good enough anymore that we have Infinity War, we're, we're seemingly putting all the Marvel things. Now we, well, we got to get Fantastic Four and X-Men in there too. And then that's not even good enough. Now we got a Fantastic Four and X-Men and the Avengers. And then we got to cross it over with DC. So we can have the Justice League and the West Coast Avengers. And we can have the, the Justice League of America. And we can have these guys. And we can have the Teen Titans. And, blah, 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 and then we'll have 5,000 characters. Ah! Like everybody just wants freaking... Everybody just wants some jarbled puke in there. And I think we have lost the appreciation. We don't even realize what we're missing. There is something so special about the standalone superhero film. And that's all Nolan had to worry about. He didn't have to worry about 50,000 other characters and 18 other spinoffs and, oh yeah, but if we do this, we got to make sure it's consistent with this, blah, 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 cinematic universe, cinematic universe. I mean, and don't get me wrong, I love cinematic universes, but I just hate the fact that that's all, that's, nobody even thinks outside of the box of cinematic universes anymore. Everybody only thinks in terms of cinematic universes now. And I think that's a shame because we've lost something. And I think the Christopher Nolan Batman films is a really good example of something that we've lost. 
the Raimi Spider-Man films, the Christopher Reeve Superman films, uh, the, the Nolan Batman films. These are great examples of us that we've lost something in our movies. There's a specialness to them because of the uniqueness of the characters that you simply cannot have when every 7-Eleven on every corner has five superheroes standing out on the rooftops looking for crime. Uh, it, it's just something that we've lost. And I'm not saying it needs to be, it's, it's, I'm not saying it has to be either or, I'm saying it can be both and. It's just that nobody wants to have a standalone superhero movie anymore. I remember when they were talking about Shazam, and I know I've gone off on a rant here a bit, but when they were talking about Shazam, and there was a hint when they were first talking about a Shazam movie of it being outside the DCEU and it being its own standalone film. And I remember my reaction on the first show that I did after that announcement was, what a great idea. In the midst of all this stuff going on with Cinematic Universe, what a great idea to have a unique standalone superhero film again. What a great idea. But I'll be honest with you guys, I was so disheartened because all I saw everywhere on the chat boards was, that would be stupid. If he's got Superman has to come, and Batman has to come, and Aquaman has to come, and everybody has to be there in every single fucking movie. And it would just, like, I just remember how disheartened as a film fan I was just reading this stuff. and going, uh, People don't even realize what we're missing and what we lost. But anyway, and again, this is coming from somebody who loves the MCU. I, I, I love the DCU. Like, I love the cinema. I do love cinematic universes, but... Would it kill us to have some great quality, single story, truly standalone superhero films that don't live in a universe with 5,000 other characters who are just like them? I don't know. That, that's just me. Anyway, and the final question of the day uh, comes to us from Kendall Barker, who writes, How long was Hulk on Sakaar? Ooh, that's a good question. Time there moves differently. Two years on Earth, sure, but was it thousands for Hulk? Uh, is it part of wow, how he learned how to talk? See, that's interesting because Thor and Loki only got separated by a millisecond, seemingly, from when each of them landed a car. But by the time Thor got there, Loki had been there for weeks. Thor, in our time, went there like a year earlier? How long has he been there? That's a good question. I'll be honest, I've never even considered that. I've never even thought about that. That is a great question. Now, here's the thing. I don't know if it goes into how he learned how to talk because, again, like Thor, he talks to Thor and Thor wasn't taken aback at all. And like, he was having conversations like, Hulk, yeah, this is normal. This is just what Hulk does. So, no, There was never a moment of like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're, you, you're talking? You're, ta you're speaking? Like, there was never even a moment of that. It was just, no, no, this is normal. We, we, uh, Hulk talks, and uh, so do I. So it kind of takes away from that. But, but yeah, how long was Hulk there? How long had he been champion? Was he champion for decades? That's a great... I, I, have, I have no idea what the answer to that is. If I ever have a chance to meet Taika Waititi again, I will absolutely think to ask him that question. Because that's one I've never heard anybody else ask. Maybe you guys know of other people who have asked the question. And who knows? Maybe they've answered that question somewhere before and I'm just not thinking of it. I'm just like surprised myself. Like that is such a great, obvious question. Why have I not thought of that? It's, it's a really great point, Kendall. A good, well done. Good job. All right, guys, that will do it for today's installment. We are now all cut up on the companion video guys stuff. Don't forget, come on back for the John Campus Show. Of course, open mic every afternoon as well. That will do it for me for this installment, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. My name's John Campion, and until my next video, bye bye